Hi there, everyone, and welcome to The Daily Gardener, and thank you for listening. I'm your host, Jennifer Ebling. It's January 13th. Today, we celebrate a man who was regarded as the most revered British botanist of his time. And we'll also learn about the botanist who considered China to be his real home. We'll hear thoughts on holly and ivy from one of my favorite gardeners. And we grow that garden library today with a book of Sunday poems inspired by the natural world. And then we'll wrap things up with the woman who wrote a book called Garden Cinderella's. What a wonderful book title. Now, before we get to all of that, I wanted to take a quick second to tell you about two ways that you can connect with the show. The first one is a website called Podchaser. And if you head on over to Podchaser, you'll notice it's a brand new podcast directory. And it's set up to help you make finding and reviewing podcasts easier than ever. In fact, if you like a particular episode, you can even rate an individual episode as opposed to rating an entire program. So that's a cool new feature. And you can find The Daily Gardener on Podchaser. And if you do, I would absolutely love it if you could take a few moments and leave a review for the show compared to so many other podcasts out there. I think The Daily Gardener has a little bit of catching up to do. I think we have about 10 reviews and I'd like to see that number grow just a little bit more in the hopes that people who like botanical history, botanical literature, and just gardening in general can hopefully find the show. So if you love the show, I would really appreciate a review from you. And you can do that over at podchaser.com. Next, I'd like to encourage you to sign up for the Daily Gardener Friday newsletter. It's a fun little email that you can receive from me every Friday. And you know, it's a lovely way for me to connect with you, the listeners of the show. So I try to make the newsletter like you're getting a little note from a garden friend. I share what's going on in my garden world, along with fun ideas and products that I'm excited about, as well as many of the kind of things that I talk about on the show during the week, like botanical history and literature. So if you'd like to get a little garden note from me on Fridays, just head on over to the website for the show, thedailygardener.org, and sign up for the free Friday newsletter today. Here's today's curated news. Well, today's post was written over on the website called Candide. It was written by Mark Rosenberg, and the title of the article is Experts Predict Gardening Trends for 2021. Well, I loved this article by Mark because I love reading about the garden predictions for the coming season. And what I especially appreciate about what Mark did in this post is that he went around and asked other gardening experts to share what's going on in their gardens and what they envision for the coming year. So I really appreciated that. They had a lot of great insights, and I thought some of those might resonate with you. Now, if you would like to check out Mark's post, you can do that very easily over in the free Facebook group for the show. It's called The Daily Gardener Community. It's on Facebook. And to find Mark's post, all you need to do is type the word trends in the search area, and then Mark's post will pop right up. Now, if you're not in the Daily Gardener community, it's really, really easy to join. The next time you're on Facebook, just search for Daily Gardener Community, where you'd search for a friend and request to join. I'd love to meet you in the group. Here's today's brevities. Today is the birthday of the botanist and former keeper of the herbarium at the Royal Botanic Garden Kew, 
John Gilbert Baker, who was born on this day, January 13th in 1834. Regarded as the most revered British field botanist of his time, John had a profound understanding of plants and an earnest desire to preserve them. Professionally, John was referred to as J.G. Baker. The scope of John's work brought him into contact with an incredible span of plant species. In addition to his impressive collecting, John identified 10 plant families, and he wrote helpful handbooks on plant groups like the Amaryllidaceae, the Bromeliaceae, the Iridaceae, the Liliaceae, and ferns. And in addition to all of that, John described and developed the very first key for the hemerocallus or the daylily. And here's a little fun fact about John. He once met Beatrix Potter, who was an amateur botanist in her own right, in addition to being an author. And as luck would have it, Beatrix wrote about meeting John in her journal on May 19th, 1896, although it didn't seem like she was very impressed with him. She wrote, We met Mr. Baker, a slim, timid-looking old gentleman with a large, thin book under his arm and an appearance of having been dried in blotting paper under a press. John was mentored by the botanist Hewitt Cottrell Watson. Hewitt was a few generations older than Darwin, and he was one of the first botanists to research plant evolution. And it was Hewitt's work that paved the way for a new science now known as ecology. In his old age, Hewitt burned all of his botanical correspondence. But thankfully, John persuaded him not to burn his herbarium. And so upon his death, Hewitt Cottrell Watson left his house and his land, as well as his books and botanical collections, to the person he thought would most appreciate them, his protege, John Gilbert Baker. In 1899, John was awarded the Gold Medal of the Linnaean Society, and eight years later, he received the Veatch Memorial Medal. Both of these awards were well-deserved. Today, Wikipedia has several pages of data devoted to the plants named by John. It's an impressive list. Conversely, John Gilbert Baker is honored by many plant names, including the iris, Bakeriana. And today is the birthday of the eccentric Hawaiian-based botanist, anthropologist, and explorer, Joseph Francis Rock, who was born on this day, January 13th in 1884. Joseph was born in Austria, but he ended up emigrating to the United States before eventually settling in Hawaii, where he was beloved. In fact, Joseph became Hawaii's first official botanist. Joseph started teaching as a professor of botany at the University of Hawaii in 1911, and he also served as a botanist for the Hawaiian Territorial Board of Agriculture. After working for 13 years in Hawaii, Joseph left to explore China, and that quest would become his primary passion. It was 1920 before Joseph left Honolulu for China for the very first time. And when he traveled, Joseph always carried a copy of David Copperfield to remind him of his own terrible childhood. And although Joseph knew that he was beloved in Hawaii, he always said that he considered China to be his real home. 
In fact, when comparing China to the rest of the world, Joseph said China was better since it was the place where life is not governed by the ticking of the clock, but by the movement of celestial bodies. In total, Joseph spent much of his adult life, more than 20 years, in southwestern China. And often, Joseph was the very first explorer to enter these interior locations that he visited. In fact, there were many times when Joseph became so embedded in the country that his peers would go too long without hearing from him, and they'd begin to think that Joseph must have died. How would they ever find him? Many could only guess that his body was probably somewhere in the Tibetan or Yunnan mountains. Yet thankfully, Joseph always turned up. And I think it's important to note, especially when you're talking about how much Joseph traveled, that he never traveled alone. When Joseph explored, he always went with a large party comprised of two dozen mules, 20 men, and an escort of nearly 200 soldiers for protection against bandits. And as for his personal effects, get this, Joseph always brought a folding bed, a table and chairs, a full set of silverware in China to dine on, an Abercrombie and Fitch canvas bathtub for hot baths, and a hand-cranked phonograph so he could listen to his favorite music, opera. Now, when he returned to Hawaii, Joseph recounted many hair-raising stories from his time in China. Like, there was this one time when Joseph had collected plants along the base of Mount Ganga in China's Tibetan borderland. Now, Mount Ganga is known as the king of the Sichuan Mountains. Joseph incorrectly predicted it was the tallest mountain in the world, but it's actually the 41st tallest. Well, one spring, Joseph had an especially great time collecting around the base of Mount Ganga. So naturally, he wanted to visit it again. But when he returned in the fall, Joseph and his party were halfway up Mount Ganga when a runner reached them with a letter from the tribal king. Apparently, after Joseph's first collecting trip, a severe hailstorm had destroyed the fields. And the tribe blamed the catastrophe on Joseph's mountain botanizing, which they believed offended the god of the mountain. And the king's letter warned that Joseph and his party were in danger of being attacked and killed by the tribe if they continued up the mountain. So the king requested that Joseph abort the trip, which he did. Years later, even after being kicked out of the country, Joseph wrote, I want to die among those beautiful mountains rather than in a bleak hospital bed alone. In addition to plants, Joseph had a knack for languages. He cataloged and transcribed Chinese manuscripts, and he actually wrote a dictionary of one of the tribal languages. Joseph had an enormous intellect, and he was multi-talented. In addition to being a botanist and a linguist, Joseph was regarded as a world expert cartographer, ornithologist, and anthropologist. Now, from a gardening standpoint, it was Joseph Rock who brought blight-resistant chestnut trees to America, and naturally, he had sourced them in China. The chestnut is in the same family as the oak, and today there are nine species of chestnut in the Northern Hemisphere. The four main species are European, Chinese, Japanese, and American chestnuts. And depending on the species, chestnut trees 
can live to be hundreds of years old. And chestnuts are unique in that they have very little protein or fat. Instead, chestnuts are carbohydrates, and they are the only nuts that contain vitamin C. And there's one other plant that I always associate with Joseph Rock. Joseph brought American gardeners more than 700 species of rhododendron. How could we ever thank him enough for that? In fact, some of his original rhododendron seeds were first successfully grown in the Golden Gate Park in San Francisco. And in 1903, the rhododendron was designated the official state flower of West Virginia. Referred to as the king of shrubs, the word rhododendron comes from two Greek words, rhodon, which means rose, and dendron, which means tree, hence rose tree. And rhododendron flowers are produced in trusses. A truss is a flower-like structure composed of many flowers. Finally, rhododendrons are in the Ericaceae plant family, which also includes blueberries, cranberries, heathers, huckleberry, mountain laurels, and trailing arbutus. So, the next time you see a chestnut tree or a beautiful rhododendron, tip your hat to Joseph Rock. In Unearthed Words, today's words are from Beth Chatto, the garden writer and gardener, from her book, Beth Chatto's Garden Notebook, and her chapter on January. Holly and Ivy are the primary images of many Christmas cards, symbols of life carrying on when much else appears dead or has vanished beneath the frozen surface. I would almost go so far as to say they should be in every garden, but perhaps I should substitute something evergreen instead of being so specific. Not everyone has the room or the right conditions for large growing evergreens. I am thinking of laurels and rhododendrons in particular. But hollies can be found in all shapes and sizes. Many are plain, but no less handsome, while several are variegated. There are seven pages of holly in Mr. Hillier's Manual of Trees and Shrubs to Tempt the Reader, and a walk around the holly collection at Kew Gardens will undoubtedly fire the imagination. Some will be difficult to obtain, but nurserymen will be pleased to propagate more unusual plants if enough of us ask for them. If you look out your favorite window now, are you satisfied with the view? Does it lack design? Would a small-leafed, narrowly pyramidal holly do anything for it? And how many plants can you see which remain green or gray or bronze throughout the winter, furnishing the bare soil at ground level? It's time to grow that garden library with today's book, A Small Porch by Wendell Berry. This book came out in 2017, and the subtitle is Sabbath Poems, 2014 and 2015. Over three decades ago, Wendell Berry started spending his Sundays in nature when the weather allowed walking and wandering around familiar territory, seeking a deep intimacy only time could provide. These walks sometimes yielded poems, and each year since, he's completed a series of these poems dated by the year of its composition. The New York Times bestselling author of Paddle Your Own Canoe, Nick Offerman, raved, Barry's essays, poetry, and fiction 
have fertilized a crop of great solace in my life and helped to breed a healthy flock of good manners to boot. This book is 80 pages of grounded and incredibly moving poetry inspired by the natural world. And you can get a copy of A Small Porch by Wendell Berry and support the show using the Amazon link in today's show notes for around $6. Finally, here's something sweet to revive the little botanic spark in your heart. It was on this day, January 13th, 1974, that the American botanist, garden lecturer, and garden writer, Helen Morgenthau Fox, passed away. In 1928, Helen wrote a book called Garden Cinderella's with the subtitle, How to Grow Lilies in the Garden. And Harvard's Ernest Henry Wilson wrote the foreword to her book. Helen shared two stories in this book that made me smile, and I wanted to share them with you today. First, Helen talked about researching her book at the Department of Agriculture in Washington. And as she's describing this experience, I can only say that I wish I would have been there with her, right beside her. Listen to this. In the library of the Department of Agriculture at Washington, I found all that has ever been published on lilies to the present time. At my request, the valuable old herbals, botanies, and flower monographs were all piled on my desk as nonchalantly as if they were so many newly published novels. It was a privilege to touch the creamy rough surface of such famous old herbals as Parkinson or Clusius and read their quaint descriptions. One day, I had Rodute's Leliasi, the lilies, in my hands, and when I found it contained only a few of the true lilies, I felt quite like the fox in the fable, because the price had always kept it way out of my reach. And Helen also shared that she had sent out a survey to determine which lilies were being grown across the United States. Naturally, the survey responses paved the way for Helen to make some new garden friends. And this is where she shares an experience that'll be familiar to most gardeners. Making new friends while looking at flowers. Is there anything better than that? Here's the excerpt. Sending out the questionnaire made many new friends for me, and I was delighted to come across a lady who was growing Washingtonianum, perii, japonicum, brownii, and other difficult lilies very successfully in western New York. My lily friends were most kind and one of them telegraphed me when the Nilgarienzi was in flower in his garden, since he knew I had not seen it. So I traveled to Washington to look at the visitor from far away, blooming as if quite at home in this strange country. And there, on a broiling July day, Three lily fans generously spent hours showing their treasures and explaining it to a stranger whose only bond was a mutual love of flowers, what they had done, and especially what they hoped to accomplish. Thanks for listening to The Daily Gardener. And remember, for a happy, healthy life, garden every day.
The Daily Gardener is produced in lovely Wyoming, Minnesota, with the help of Paige Mance, Brooke Beerbaum, Kiana Rayleigh, Maddie Doyle, Natalie Decker, and Eric Begay. You can find The Daily Gardener on all your favorite social media. You can follow the show on Instagram, and listeners always have a standing invitation to join the free Facebook group for the show. Just search for Daily Gardener Community the next time you're on Facebook and request to join. All the stories and books that are featured on the show can be found over at thedailygardener.org, thedailygardener.org. And while you're there, be sure to sign up for my free Friday newsletter. Last but not least, you can share your own gardener greetings on the show by emailing me at jennifer at thedailygardener.org. I'm your host, Jennifer Ebling, and as always, have a great day in the garden, and we'll see you tomorrow.